All right, so before we start this last game, I just wanted to say I'm very happy that, that I undertook this project. It's lasted for, what, probably like, probably close to a year at this point since the first speedrun video. Of course, I could do another speedrun and I could do an infinite amount of them. Maybe one day I will. But I just wanted to, you know, there's obviously, there's a lot more content left to produce. I want to hit a million subs one day which is a highly ambitious goal given that I need, that I'm only a fifth of the way there. But, um, you know, I think there, there is just a tremendous amount of other topics that I need to cover. Um, and I want to, I want the channel to be like a vast, I want it to be sort of like a Khan Academy of chess, right? It has everything in sufficient quantities to make people well-versed of all levels. For example, right now I, I'm working on the puzzles. You know, there will be openings. And I know that I sacrificed some subscribers with the lack of clickbait titles, but that's just my philosophy and that's never gonna change. So anyways, the speedrun has been great. Let's get started on hopefully our last game. If I win, that is. If I lose, then it continues. Okay, we're playing an NM High Plains. David Vest. Oh, David Vest, I know who that is. Okay, I've heard of him. Okay, we have a French. And you guys already know what we play against the French. We play e5. And now we go knight. Oh, oh, he goes b6. Okay, so we've already faced b6 once. This is an alternative to the main move c5. This is an alternative to the main move c5. And the idea of the move b6 is to get the bishop out to a6. Um, and one thing that we can do to slow down the move bishop a6, in fact, prevent it entirely, is to play pawn to c3, which is a move we normally play on the advanced. How did it prevent bishop a6? Because if bishop a6, then we take it, and we go queen a4 check, picking off the knight. Okay, so c6. Now, th there's nothing particularly special that we have to do against the threat of bishop a6. All we really want to do is just develop our pieces nicely, starting with our bishop. Let's go bishop b3. a5. Now, let's think about where we want to put this knight. Let's think about where we want to put this knight. Um, do we want to put it on f3 or do we want to put it on e2? If you've watched some of my French games before, you will know, or maybe you can remember, that I have an affinity to um, putting the knight on e2. I like putting that on e2. Why is that? Because I like keeping the f-pawn free to charge black's pawn chain in the French. Um, this idea of going f4, f5 later in the game, I really like that plan because this pawn on e6 could get under tremendous pressure. But first, we need to complete our development. We don't want to rush with f4. Let's castle. Let's do all the nice things. And then when, when we're ready, we can go f4 and try to go for f5. Okay, so queen takes d3. Um, a4. So he's obviously expanding on the queen side. He's not really developing his pieces, which tells me that we need to press the foot to the gas pedal as quickly as we can. Um, now, he could meet f4 with g6. In fact, he probably will. But that would create weaknesses on the king side, which we could try to exploit with our other pieces. So let's see how black reacts to this. He goes knight h6. Okay, so that stops f5. Um, our idea is to execute the f5 pawn break. If we can do that in a successful version, we get an amazing position. Now, in such positions of the closed center, nothing happens quickly against good players. All right, you're not going to accomplish any of your ideas by being impatient. You have to be very methodical. You have to know when to develop. And one thing that I could propose here, yeah, we could go knight g3, but then black goes g6. How else can we expand on the king side? What is an alternate idea? Yeah, so knight d2 would be a great move, patiently developing the knight. But I like a more direct idea. Think of it this way. How, can, how else can we contest the f5 square? Yeah, so I'm talking about the move h3. Now, I want to make it clear, are we going to play g4 on the next move? Maybe not. It depends on what black does. But I want to reserve the option of playing g4 in case we need to quickly control the f5 square, if that makes sense. Queen c8. Okay, so he probably wants queen a6. He wants to trade these queens. This is all very typical kind of French play. And I don't see any reason not to play g4. Let's go. Let's go g4. Let's, uh, let's expand on the king side. 
It's weakening in committal, yes, but how is black going to exploit that exactly? He's got a knight on h6, which is entirely blocking all of black's kingside play. So I'm not really worried about my king being exposed here. Does that make sense? And, and I'm going to talk a little more about that after the game. Let's develop our knight. Let's, let's get our pieces out, right? Let, let's actually bring the knight maybe to f3, maybe even to g5. And obviously after queen a6, we do not want to trade our queen. Now that limits our options to exactly two. We can go queen e3 and we can go queen f3. Now think for a second about where you would prefer to put the queen. There are arguments to be made for both of these moves. But given that we are trying to prepare f5, I like the idea of putting the queen on f3 more because when we play f5, we will have our queen and our rook nicely poised uh, to exploit what potentially is going to be the opening of the f-file, right? Now, what is our next move going to be? How are we actually going to prepare f5? Well, a lot of you have already mentioned this move. We were going to play it earlier, but now that we played pawn to g4, we can play this move with a clean conscience, and that is knight g3. And everything is now finally ready. We will play f5 on the next move, most likely, unless he goes rook g8, which I think is likely as well, trying to prevent f5. Thank you, Nacharya114. And start thinking about what we are going to do in response to rook g8. I have an idea for an interesting maneuver if he goes rook g8. In fact, even if he doesn't, maybe we won't rush with f5. Because that move is not really going anywhere, and I'm not seeing too much danger on our queen side. So maybe we can make some improving moves first. We'll see. We'll see how black plays. Okay, go c5. So in that case... I think f5 definitely comes with a lot of risk attached to it. f5 comes with a lot of risk attached to it. And I'm going to make a ridiculous looking move. I'm going to make a ridiculous looking move. And hopefully I will do a halfway decent job explaining it after the game. I'm going to go knight back to b1. All right. Go knight back to b1. Looks ridiculous, I know. But try to come up with, I mean, I'm not saying it's a great move, but I think it's going to work out. I think it's going to work out. Now, the main idea of this move is to unblock the bishop, because when black starts attacking the d4 pawn, I do not want this pawn to collapse. The pawn on d4 is holding our entire position together. So what is the idea of knight b1? It unblocks the bishop. What can the bishop do? The bishop can go out to e3 in order to protect this pawn. And the knight from b1 can redirect to c3, which seems to be a more active square than d2. Or perhaps even to a3, but probably to c3. And then the rook could come out to c1. So the whole idea of that was to retool my queenside pieces primarily in order to protect the d4 pawn from collapse. But mostly, yeah, mostly to coordinate my pieces. He goes queen b5. This guy is good. And I think that this is a great opportunity to strike. Do we really care about this pawn? All right, I wouldn't care too much about the pawn on b2. And I would try to take this opportunity to develop our pieces as quickly as we can. What does that mean? What does that entail? Yeah, just go knight c3. Pretend that nothing is happening. Go knight c3, and if queen takes b2, we can just protect the knight with a rook. And now we start threatening various discoveries. And various sacrifices are very seriously on the cards here because, I mean, his his king side is extremely underdeveloped. And I would even say undeveloped. Rook ac1, creating the x-ray against the knight. And I'm smelling a lot of tactical potential here. We also have that old idea of going f5. If nothing has happened to it, we can still do that, but we might not need to. We might have that queen side that we, where we can operate. Oh, that was 97, man. This is looking very juicy, but we have to be very methodical here. We have to be very methodical here. How do we actually break through? Who has any ideas? Can we go f5? Well, we actually can. It turns out that we can go f5. Or at least I think we can go f5. But the point of this move is not to open the h file, uh, the f file. The point of this move, as a hint, is to create a pathway for one of our pieces. Now, think about what piece could go where. 
how does how does the position change? Well, what squares are no longer under Black's control? You might see that the h5 square is no longer under Black's control, right? The pawn used to be on g6, so we can go knight h5 and try to get the knight over to that very juicy outpost on f6, accumulating the pressure, and eventually we're going to open something up and go for a mating attack. We also could have gone pawn to g5 and forced the knight back to g8. Yeah, knife f6 is a big threat. Storm clouds begin to gather around black king. Bishop g5 is another move that we can contemplate a little bit later. Particularly if the black king moves over to d8, the move bishop g5 would create a pin against the knight. Yeah, black's position is not great. And he goes knight g8 on his own volition, trying to prevent knight f6. Now, we already know from all of the speedrun wisdom that the most important question you could ask yourself in such a situation is, does, does he actually prevent knight f6? And if you think about that question for a second, let's do some calculations. So knight f6 check, knight takes f6, pawn takes f6. That pawn on f6 is almost as strong as a knight. It forces the black knight out of e7, and that king on e8 is going to be wide open. I mean, there's going to be nothing around it. And a sacrifice on d5 is on the cards in order to get the rook to c8. So you already could start ideating tactically here. I mean, basically just throwing anything at black, I think, is going to result in checkmate. That's why black is thinking here. So th there are a million ways to play here. Um, we, don't, we didn't have to go knight f6. Maybe it's hasty, but I want to play very concretely here. This is also known as the Sam Shanklin question. Yeah, Can, what happens if I do it anyway? Okay, so knight f6, we, we take with a pawn attacking the knight. And once the knight moves away from e7, if you take a close look at this pawn on d5, that could be a magnet for a knight sacrifice in order to rip open the center, open up a file for the rook, and we're going to have a mating attack there most likely. Hopefully that's clear. Hopefully the logic is, is transparent enough. What if he just lets the knight back? Well, what do you mean? Okay, so he's obviously thinking about not taking the knight, but he decides to take it, and we take it. And the question for black now is maybe he just sacrifices. No, no, he goes knight c8. Oh, we have a sexy move here. I mean, we have several really nice moves. Um, if we want to go for the materialistic approach, we have a particularly nice move, but I don't think we're going to make it. I think what I want us to do, I mean, obviously we have a discovery against the knight, but the question, how do we, how do we squeeze the most out of that discovery? Well, think of it this way. Can we, what can we do with this knight? Well, we can play knight takes d5, but it would be very nice if the move knight takes d5 came with tempo. The, the only issue that I see with the move knight takes d5 is that black does not have to take the knight. Black can go knight d6. Knight takes a4 is an excellent move. But there's also a problem there. After rook takes a4, rook takes c8, king d7, we haven't really bit into black's main pawn mass in the center. So I want the best of both worlds. I do want to take on d5, but I don't want to do it immediately, hint, hint, wink, wink. I want to get black's queen onto a vulnerable square so that I can play knight takes d5 with tempo. What am I hinting at? We start with rook f2, and we're trying to get the queen back to b4 so that we can take on d5. If he's smart, he'll go queen a3, but then we have knight b5 with a fork, and that's winning as well. So there are simply no moves for black. Wherever he brings his queen, hell awaits. Yeah, we did have knight d1. I'm very impressed that some of you are uh, discovering this move, and there is a specific reason why I, I think knight d1 is not the most accurate, and I'll explain it after the game. It's, it's a pretty high-level reason. Okay, queen b4, and boom goes the dynamite. Finally, we actually break through. And notice that the patience pays off. We accumulated the attack, and when we finally pounce, it's totally devastating. Okay, queen d6. Again, 
do not get too overly confused here. So we can start by taking the knight. We can start by taking the knight. And now we just need to find one more or two more accurate moves, which turns out not to be that easy because our rook is hanging and our knight is hanging and we can't really move our knight and defend the rook, or can we? The question on your mind should be, can we move this knight away and defend the rook or vice versa? Is that possible? Well, the move rook c2 should be winning, but then queen takes d5. Will knight b6, then queen takes b6. Be careful, be careful. Knight e7, bingo. Knight e7 fulfills all of the tasks here because he can't take, he loses the rook. That's the problem with being undeveloped is that none of your pieces work the way they should. Now we're just up a rook. The rest is easy. Bishop takes f6, rook takes h7, and that's it. Yeah, what Black can resign. A pretty anticlimactic end to the attack, but nonetheless, sometimes you just got to roll with it. You know what I'm saying? Okay, king e7. And now finally, and this is hilarious, we played f5 all this time ago. And only now are we actually taking on f5 uh, in order to open up the file. Okay, black will probably go e5, then we're going to take it. The rest is, as they say, is easy to follow without commentary. Okay, many ways to win in such a position. Um, generally, we just identify, okay, just resigns. And there it is, the end of the speed run. That was the final game. That was a good one. Let's analyze it and then we'll call it a day. Okay, so B6 is an old system that, that's existed for a long time. And again, why did I play C3? Because he's trying to go Bishop A6 and trade off the French Bishop. If you know anything about the French, you know that black is always trying to get rid of that Bishop. Now, could we go Queen A4 check immediately? And this is just to the point that move order is extremely important. What would happen if we went queen a4 check immediately? And is, that, is this also sufficient? Yeah, so a lot of you guys are on the right track, but no, c6, then we take the bishop. Unfortunately, black has the move queen d7 here, and black hits the queen, we don't have time to take the bishop. We have to respond to the tension, and after queen d7, king d7, black is out of the woods. So in such situations, you often have to do the trade first, and then you can actually win the knight. So black goes c6 in order to cover the diagonal. That's the idea of the move. Bishop d3, a5. Um, and I guess the point of a5 is to expand on the queen side, and also so that after bishop a6, that knight on a6 will not be easily attacked. Knight e2. Yeah, I don't like the way black is playing. I think this is how you play the system, but I think it's extremely dubious. Okay, so we castle, takes, takes, a4, black continues to not develop, and we bang on the gas pedal here, f4. Knight h6, and now h3. So here a lot of you are suggesting the tempting move knight g3, which seems like a more natural way to prepare f5. The issue that I had with this is that after g6, we will have a very hard time executing the f5 pawn rake. We would really love to have a pawn on g4 so that f5 becomes more realistic. Um, now, if you actually if you do such a thing, it's not the end of the world. You can get the knight over to f3. White is still better, but I think h3 is just a much more direct way uh, to prepare to prepare uh, the king side attack. Okay, so queen c8, we go g4, black goes g6, and now very patient move knight d2. Just develop your pieces. No need to rush with f5. Well, Arch, Simpcat, that depends on how much material you, you, can, you potentially stand to win. If you can win a queen effortlessly, then in 90% of cases, that's what you should go for. If there's any uncertainty about checkmate. Could you have played bishop e3 here? Yes. I'll tell you why I didn't play bishop e3. The reason I didn't play bishop e3 here is because of queen a6, which you played in the game. And you guys might look at this and say, well, what's the problem? You just move the queen away. But I wanted my queen to be able to move to the king side. I didn't want to make a move like queen d1. It wouldn't have been a big deal if, even if I did this. Thank you, holy words. Um, we can still do all the stuff I did. But I wanted the queen to play a more active role in preparing f5. So that's why I played knight d2 here. And after queen a6, I played queen f3. Now it turned out after rook a7, knight g3, c5... 
I kind of regretted. Okay, knight b1 is actually the third the third move according to the engine. Oh, it's close to becoming the first now. Yeah, knight b1 is a good move. Because at this point, I was really regretting that my bishop wasn't on e3. Like, if white has the bishop on e3, then everything is complete. So, let's, to understand how I came up with knight b1, um, first of all, like, you have to realize that going backwards with a piece in order to let another piece out is not an unprecedented idea. I know that knight b1 looks ugly, but I, I also know that I'm going to bring that knight back out of b1 at some point, and I can afford such a thing because black has not developed, he's pushed his pawns out, so I have a bunch of extra tempi that I can use. Um, one moment. And I can even show you, I'm sure I can show you an example of, of you know, a very similar idea in a high-level game. Um, just a second. You know, this idea of going knight b1 is, is not as uncommon as you guys might, might think it is. One moment. I want to see if I can find an example of it. Okay. Um, thank you. I need a drink. <laughs> I need a drink. That's a funny one. Okay, anyways, it's it's hard to find. Oh, there it is. I mean, Alexander Alakine, watch what he does. Um, he literally plays this move in the opening. So, what? look at this game. Alakine against Tartakauer, London 1932. Um, okay, so basically, it's an Albin counter gambit. Oh, sorry, it's a Budapest. Knight e4 is an old move. And Alakine literally, in this position, plays knight b1 with two ideas. The first is to open up the bishop. The second is to reroute the knight to d5, kind of like I did. And that knight very quickly gets to d5, and everything is hunky-dory. Alakine develops the bishop, black gets a weakness, and Alakine won the game pretty effortlessly. So... The, don't be too surprised when a piece is moved back like this. It's, you know, if you've got time, letting another piece out is, uh, can be the best way to improve your position. So why didn't I go f5? Because after g takes f5, g takes f5, I was a little bit concerned about a scenario where my pawn on d4 would become a very big weakness. And even though the f file becomes open, uh, it's very hard to defend this pawn. Because if you play a move like queen f2, then black can still go knight takes d4 and bishop c5. So for that reason, I decided to invest some time. And let's get the bishop out first. Also, black shouldn't have opened the c file. That helps us. And now everything is great. We go knight c3. All of the pieces are out. And I've only sacrificed one pawn for it. Now, probably uh, queen b5, queen takes b2 hastened to the defeat, but still. Um... Okay, so knight e7, and here comes f5. G takes f5, knight, knight comes around to h5. These maneuvers are all very straightforward. Knight g8, knight f6 check, takes, takes, knight c8, and rook f2. Why didn't I go knight d1 here winning the knight? Because after queen takes a2, it's very easy to miss the forest for the trees. This position is not that obvious. White is winning still for sure, but we've given them this far advanced passer. We have not succeeded in bringing the rook into the game. In fact, we have blocked the rook with our knight, which I didn't want to do. So I draw the threshold usually at a rook. If you can win a rook or a queen and trade in the attack, that's often worth it. If you can win a minor piece, but do some damage to your attack and relinquish it, that's often not worth it. I figure that I could get a lot more uh, if I go directly for mate here, given how weak black's king is. So that's where rook f2 came from. Rook f2, queen b4. If queen a3, then we have a fork and we win the knight. We win everything. And now here comes knight takes d5. Boom. And very important move, knight e7, actually. This, this move uh, defends the rook. And because of the pin, everything kind of works out for white. And that's it. OK, I mean, he did right to resign, because after rookie two, everything is easy. Any questions? 
Can you explain how you evaluate giving up a pawn a little bit more? Sure. So I can't give you a formula for when you do such a thing, but why did my intuition indicate that it was okay to give up a pawn? First of all, if you're not sure, oftentimes you don't need to sacrifice. When in doubt, just play a move like queen f2 or rook f2. Nothing bad is going to happen to your position. But if you look at the big picture here, what was this b2 pawn actually doing and what specific damage are we doing by sacrificing? Well, not much. The only reason I would see this backfiring is if black managed to get the game into an end game and had a pawn majority. And look at how undeveloped black is. We get a rook to c1, we get our pieces back out. The queen is a huge liability on b2 and we get threats of knight takes d5. So I'm just counting up all of the sources of compensation, everything that I get in turn for the pawn. And it becomes a no-brainer. I mean, you get so much in return for it. And that pawn on b2 was not essential to the functioning of white's position at all. It would be different if we had sacrificed the d4 pawn. That is the center pawn which holds together white's structure. So it's, you know, not all pawns play the same, you know, bear the same weight in the position. How do you decide to move in with a knight? Yeah, so again, I, I've made this very clear in other moments in the speedrun. If you turn the engine on, you will see probably five or six completely viable ways to continue the attack. All right. In fact, the engine's top move is the ridiculous knight g2. The idea of which is to play rook b1, which you could not play here because you would have dropped the knight. And the point is that the queen is semi-trapped. If black just develops, you go rook b1, and after queen a3, you have this fork with knight b5, or bishop c1 trapping the queen. So that's one way you can continue the attack. But... How did I come up with the idea? Well, first I saw the f6 square. I knew that I wanted to get a knight to f6 for many, many moves. And I also know that f5 is one of the main ideas that we've been preparing for a long time. So just putting the two together, when you have a breakthrough, new squares and new pathways are often created for your pieces. And so you need to reassess the situation and see if any new pathways, any new maneuvers are possible. And why would you want a knight on f6? Well, that's self-explanatory. You don't even need to play chess to know that. A knight on f6 like this, supported by a pawn, is the best attacker that you can possibly get. What if bishop b4 in that position? In this position? Well, then knight b5, for example. It's not scary. And black is busted because everything hangs. Why did the dude play a4? Well, I think he played a4 just to expand on the queen side. He was just trying to uh, grab space and clamp down on my queen side. I, I don't like the way you play this opening. I think it's highly dubious to halt your development like this, but um, but that's that's what he did. At some point, moment, you expected rook g8. Yeah. So I expected rook g8 here. Thank you, Duke Duke, for the 16 months. How does it stop f5? Because after f5, g takes f5, g takes f5, black and play knight takes f5, and, um, and that's it. Uh, you are not able to proceed any further. So after rook g8, very possibly we would have moved our king aside. Thank you, Bill Hayes, for the 12 months. Dubious means suspicious. And that's all, guys. That's all she wrote. And this is where we're going to end. I want to thank everybody for all the tremendous support throughout the speed run. It's been a really fun ride. And, of course, there will be plenty of other content to go around. Um, I'll continue to play games with subscribers and comment them speedrun style. But in terms of uh, at least the immediate plans, uh, I will replace this with other educational content during the stream. Um, I've already talked about some of my plans when I'm going to do some thinking. So um, probably we will have another speedrun a couple of months down the line. But, um, you know, I want to let everybody catch up to, to all the videos and stuff. So closing ceremony. Well, um, yeah, that was the closing ceremony. This is a historical moment. And we got subs to go along with it. Overcast Delight, gifting five. Thank you, Overcast Delight. All right, I'm going to collect any subs. You guys go my way. Thank you. Thank you, Overcast Delight. I appreciate it. Much obliged. None of this would be possible without everybody's engagement. And uh, it would just be me talking to a wall. Curious chimpanzee with a five gifted. Damn, girl. Oh, my God. 
Yeah, so again, all of the five minute speedrun is up on YouTube if you're new to the channel. And most of the 10 minute speedrun is up on YouTube as well. Um, these videos are gonna keep coming out for the next couple of weeks. Um, but again, there, there's so much other stuff to do and content to create that I wanna start moving in that direction as well. But yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah, 2 million subscribers, maybe in 25 years when I learn how to clickbait. All right, thank you guys. This was fun.